opportunities do not come your way. You have to create them in this world. That is Rupesh Bhatia, a specialist master with Deloitte Digital. I'm Josh Burke, a developer evangelist for Salesforce. And here on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Rupesh about his experiences with developers working with consultants and having a consultant mindset. And I want to highlight that a lot of this is career advice. And Rupesh wasn't always destined to be a programmer. Okay, so I come from a barber's family. My dad is a barber. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And getting into an engineering college was itself a big kind of a feat uh, from where I come from. I was kind of prepared to go into uh, do a graduation in mathematics and uh, part time help my father on his uh, purple shop. Hmm. But yeah, I secured good marks and I I luckily got got a merit set into an engineering college and uh, I I went through the four years. And uh, yeah. The first job happened to me in a very accidental way. The The first offer I took up was primarily because uh, there was financial need and it was into web development. Mm. So that kind of excited me. But I was always looking for more technical role. I was always mm. interested in programming. Okay, so getting to our main topic, define D to C or developer to consultant for me. Yeah, so D to C, uh, developer to consultant for me is any developer who is building applications, who is doing programming, mm-hmm. will adopt a consulting mindset when i say consulting mindset start thinking about for whom are they making that page for whom are they building that code who is mm-hmm. going to use the end end application that you are going to build right which personas are you catering to your module is catering to which all personas when you are building a trigger or a visual force page or a lightning component you have to understand how that fits into the overall module how that module fits into the overall business process and how that business process will, at the end of the day, when it gets delivered in production, who is going to use it, how it's going to impact their day-to-day lives. Are there any cross dependencies with other modules which are there, might be building by some other developer, right? Mm -hmm. So having that mindset of relating the technical world to the business world and vice versa. When you hear a business requirement, can you relate it to a technical solution in your mind? right? That is to me is a consulting mindset where you might not be facing your customers on a day-to-day basis being a developer, Mm -hmm. but you are interacting with someone. It might be your technical lead. It might be your scrum lead. It might be your client stakeholders, or it might be your own internal onshore team, right? Treat them as your clients. When you're interacting with them, ask more queries, try to get the business context and that will help you evolve as a consultant. And I often get this complaint or uh, or uh, excuse by the developer saying that we don't get enough client facing roles. Treat mm-hmm. each and everyone with whom you are interacting on an official project as your client and that's how you'll evolve and you'll make a difference for yourself and that's how you'll create more opportunities. So that's how I've always approached my career. And that's my general advice to everyone. What's involved in the pre-sale cycle and why is that important to a developer? Yeah, pre-sale cycle is the the kind of an extension to the sales engine. It's part of Mm -hmm. the sales engine for any organization. It's a process of getting more work or getting more projects or getting more accounts for your company. And uh, typically the teams involved are for larger accounts or larger clients, there are these account teams and these account teams basically form a pre-sales team and it could be a combination of both onshore and offshore at times or it could be uh, also be led directly from onshore but here are the group of people who work together in a very aggressive timeline to put together the entire rfp response document a formal Mm -hmm. proposal document to the client based on their requirements. Now, these requirements could be high level, very detailed, based on the nature of the RFP, but this group basically works towards preparing that formal response document, putting all the sections of a proposal document in place, and coming up with the right estimates with the sole intent of winning that deal. Yeah, and it, that that's a really interesting phase of, of a contract because if you don't have that technical person in the room and you only have the salespeople in the room right. then you know then then what gets signed now now somebody you know maybe that offshore developer in india is the guy who has to try to clean up the mess of tech you know requirements that actually may not have the right technical solutions 
Right, and I've been part of conversations, right? I mean, uh, just a technical person talking through the requirements would give a, a whole lot of confidence to your stakeholders that this vendor knows the substance and mm-hmm. they have the right SMEs on the team mm-hmm. for us to award that project, right? Yeah. So a technical person talking to business confidently about a solution will do a whole lot of good to the overall team and the company. Yeah. And I think it's also kind of interesting as we've had on the podcast before talking about, you know, architects talking about how architects can kind of interact with developers, but you're also talking about the reverse. Like, what are there tips for developers when they're interacting with their tech leads and when they're with their technical architects? Yeah, on that front, there's very interesting observation which I've had. Most mm-hmm. of the developers tend to aim for becoming architects. Mm-hmm. without really understanding that architects also have a, a very important uh, skill set of interacting with business as well. Not with the uh, all the business stakeholders, but when you are mm-hmm. discussing solutions, right? if you are talking to a C-level executive, they might be uh, aware of Salesforce as a platform or they might not be, right? So you have need to have that skill set where you can converse technical stuff with the technical folks, or the yeah. technical stakeholders, as well as you should be equally competent enough to discuss your solutions in a very layman language to a business stakeholder as well. And I think that's the missing piece of which I found, uh, which I've observed at least in the developer community is everybody wants to be an architect, but they miss this, uh, this very key aspect of soft skills, mm-hmm. communication, having the right questions in place, challenging business requirements based on your know-how of the Salesforce platform, right? Mm -hmm. These are some of the key attributes which I think any architect should have. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And and here's where you're describing a distinction between like developers who can talk tech, architects who can talk structure, and then you're kind of adding on another layer, consultants who can talk to the clients. Yes. Nice. So I know you can't talk about specific clients, but can you talk about some projects because because I, I'm curious about the other side, uh, of the, the other direction. Like, uh, I guess actually, let me ask a, a more generic question. Do you have from the from the person who is the onshore and they're the people working with the clients? Do you have any advice for them when they're the ones communicating back to the offshore team? So I've been fortunate enough to work in both the spaces. Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of short term travels for my projects in the past Mm -hmm. uh, for three weeks, two weeks, one month, right? Uh, Just for a requirement gathering session or a discovery session or just for the train the trainer sessions or just for conducting UATs for very short durations. And I've been in those shoes as well, where you are into like 10 different things where you're handling your business stakeholders, you are engaging with the IT stakeholders, you are into this uh, daily meetings, workshops, uh, going through the business requirements, trying to understand the business world, trying to map a, a solution on Salesforce platform, yeah. along with all of these things, right? And somewhere doing all of these things, client might come up, okay, we have heard about this app exchange. Do you know how it works? Right? And on the fly, you might have to do a quick POC for them. Right. right. You might have to also run the demos with the with these stakeholders on the fly, Right. And these are yeah. traits of a consultant. But when you interact with your offshore team or the developers who are remotely who do not have all of these context, a good consultant will always ensure that they pass on as much as information to the offshore team. Because yeah, sure. if you can do that early in the game during your requirement gathering workshops or during the discovery sessions, you will have lesser challenges during the build cycle, during your sprint Mm. demos. Mm -hmm. If the developer understands the business context well in advance, they Mm -hmm. will ensure that they will deliver quality. It's not just about code quality. It's about the quality of the application as well. Mm -hmm. And they will will have that overlap with you where they they might also come up with a suggestion or a better technical solution, which you might not have thought through, right? And that is this this handshake, which I'm really looking forward to. And I always make it a point that whenever I'm into these workshops, documentation becomes the key at times, right? You might not Mm. have, if you are in a back-to-back meetings, you might not have the whole whole lot of time 
to document everything and pass it over right and mm-hmm. that becomes a, a kind of a practical challenge which every consultant face mm-hmm. how do i offload information to my remote teams right and that's where you need to be innovative you need to be creative on how you uh, take down your notes how do you articulate that to your offshore team so that you are all aligned when you are talking about a requirement right yeah and i understand those challenges there's no kind of a theoretical way to do it but it's yes. more practical and if you're a good consultant you'll always find a good way of doing that handshake got it that's so that's that's pretty interesting so so it's kind of a warning that you don't want that person who's who actually happens to be in the room to lose any of the information because they're hearing it verbally and maybe it's in their head but if it's not documented, then it can't be passed on to anybody. And then the offshore developer can't get the context to get that that code done right. Right. And oftentimes what I've seen is the focus is on documentation and it becomes a, a focused area of is the document is in the right format? Yeah. Do we have the like the right sections in place? Is the template right? No, focus on the content. Have we captured <laughs> all the, the stuff that we had discussed with the business? Gotcha. Right? Yeah. Have we captured all the personas? Have we captured the, the right stuff that the, the development team needs? Mm-hmm. So I think that's where the, the those gaps are and that's where uh, projects struggle and the teams have to scramble through the build phase trying to get more understanding. Uh, during sprint demos, you you can get like shockers from the clients. Okay, this is not what I had meant. Right. Okay, where is the gap? Okay, someone didn't do their job, right? Right, right. Do you have any advice or tips when it comes to? I mean, we I don't I agree. Don't focus on the format, but either on the format or tools that can help that documentation be successful. Notes, scribbled notes, uh, mm-hmm. handwritten diagrams, just mm-hmm. trying to explain myself how this entire solution would look like. Got it. It could be a formal Word document, Word template. Like To me, format, uh, yes, every company has their own formats. Right? Yeah. And you have to go by those predefined templates, right? But I think if you can get the all the right kind of content into that template, it's kind of a teamwork, right? If you are not able to do as a consultant by your own, always yeah. find someone who can do it for you, right? People, everyone has their own individual skill set. There will be someone who can do who who can do a good job at documenting stuff, right? Yeah. If that is not your trait, do not attempt it and do not force yourself to do it, right? Find that right person <laughs> right. who can do that for you. And uh, yeah, I mean... It, every company has their own set of tools and own set of mechanisms to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to comment on any one, but yeah, feel I think <laughs> okay. person should get comfortable in what they are trying to do. So it's not the the importance, not the tool, it's not the format. It's just making sure that the information is getting stored somewhere. Yes, that's that's for me at least uh, the the handshake between onshore and offshore. That's the mm-hmm. key element. Got it. Uh, so okay, so going back to the question I was forming earlier. I know you can't talk specific clients, but do you have like real world examples where maybe you like dodged a bullet with a client because this information was properly handed from onshore to offshore? Instead of stating one such example, I mean, it mm-hmm. happens with almost all the projects, right? Oh, got it. Where, yeah, okay. Where, uh, where, let's say you're delivering a project, right? And yeah. the client comes back during a sprint and asks for, okay, we can we add a couple of fields in this object? Okay, and we'll get these fields populated from our backend systems, and we let the integration team know that they need to populate these fields. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to delegate this task to my development team, right, it's basically creating those three fields, right, Right. and setting up the light level of field level security, and Mm -hmm. off they go, right? Versus, it might be a checkbox, and if you really deep dive in with the the business stakeholders on what they're really trying to do, it yeah. might turn up that they are trying to do a kind of a sneak peek into a solution where they might have to build an actual module out of it. Gotcha. Right? And I, I can't like quote exact requirements here, but <laughs> right. but often in projects, that's what you see. It it starts with a very small element of a of a request. And when mm-hmm. we actually dig deeper into the the request with the business stakeholders and if you ask the right questions you will understand what's the end-to-end implication of Mm -hmm. having that one field 
on an account object or on an opportunity, right? That right. means something to the business, either to an ERP, either to a source, any source system, either to an MDM system, right? That yeah. has a potential impact somewhere. Unless you understand that, do not agree upon any solution unless you get the 360 view of a requirement. We talk about customer 360. For a developer, it should be requirements 360. Unless you understand that, do not go for that solution. Nice. I like that. Re re requirements 360. So that's so that's really good advice because that feels like you are trying to get ahead of, of scope creep before it even really happens. I mean, that's how you will save yourself, right? Otherwise, you'll, you'll get up bur burning yourself on projects. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's very obvious if you, if you don't safeguard yourselves yeah. by putting the right boundaries, by asking the right questions up front, you are bound mm -hmm. to uh, get into scope creep discussions. And those discussions are not good with any customer. Yeah. So let's, let's flip back to the other direction. If I am that offshore worker the offshore developer and i feel like i need to escalate something do you have any advice for making sure that that's a process that goes smoothly yeah so every company has a hierarchy mm -hmm. right every project has a manager every project has a tech lead i mean not every project it depends upon the team structure but any any person within the team will have a go-to person too mm -hmm. okay and at times what happens is either we don't understand the requirement either we are having this perspective in our mind that if we kind of escalate this, this will not reflect good on us, on our careers, that a developer is saying no to certain thing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this conscious mind of ours which says that, should I say no to something? What will happen if someone hears no from my side? Mm -hmm. uh, will they hold it against me, right? And any team who can promote that culture of empowering their developers to speak up their mind, will be successful on any of the projects, right? Nice. So yeah. there will always be people around you with whom you can have that one-on-one -on -one talks. There will be forums within your organization where you can formally put forward your uh, thought process, right? And to me, email is a, is a weapon where any professional can use it in a very lethal way at times mm. whenever they have to push back on certain things. Right? Hmm. Whether it is within the team, whether it is on requirements with the customers, whether it's on their onshore counterparts, mm -hmm. use email as a formal mode of communication to mm. put forward your thought process. Mm -hmm. But again, you have to be very careful in how are you representing your, uh, your intent, your content in an email. And that's where email communication is, is right top there in my list, right? Verbal communication yeah, is right top there in my list. Email or verbal. So I normally give this example in my campaign uh, when I do these sessions is yeah. what happens when there is an escalation? Whenever there is a project escalation, what happens? The leadership yeah. from both the sides will have a call, mm -hmm. will have email exchanges. What happens on email exchanges? You basically put a root cause analysis and a mitigation plan, or you justify whether there's an issue, not an issue, right? Whatever the case is, it's basically content how you articulate that content on an email, how do you write mm. that, is mm -hmm. what matters. And through an e one single email, you can douse the fire. Or through mm. a one single call among the stakeholders, you can douse the fire if you can communicate in a right way. And that's where communication is a core aspect of any consultant. And mm -hmm. any developers who can pick up this skill set early in the game is bound to be successful. So talking about communication broadly across this, do you see challenges that come up because of language barriers or cultural barriers? And do you have any advice with that? Absolutely. And there's a whole lot of myth that communication means fluent English. Mm -hmm. To me, communication is simplification of your words and mm. articulating in a manner that my recipient understands. Yeah. Right. When you're dealing with European stakeholders their ascent might be different that versus uh, american right. uh, stakeholders right and that's why i say customer facing roles if you get a chance to travel always travel because the more people you meet the more cultures you know hmm. uh, the more empathy you will develop in your minds while yes. working on projects yes. right and that's an important aspect in a in a consulting world as well that uh, even if you're working remote right take that 5 minutes of your call time to at least get to know each other right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're having a formal discussion, uh, not always, right? Once in a month, once in a while, 
take that liberty of introducing yourself giving your personal background giving your your uh, cultural background right try to understand each other develop that relationship when we talk about being a trusted advisor and building relationships right how yeah. do you build those relationships relationships are built with people right by knowing each other on how do we work what is our work culture what is our from where we origin from right yeah so i think that forms an important aspect of building human to human relationships and that's where uh, we all can grow together right i mean projects gets delivered projects there are burning projects there are green projects right there are all kind of projects but i think as a developer or as a human if we focus on building relationships yeah. that will work for us uh, in this professional life yeah i totally agree with that. i love that and i'll i'll throw you know, a, a quick perspective from, you know, somebody who is, you know, Midwestern or English speaking that I, I have found and I've actually had, you know, in some of the interviews I've done with people where English is their second language, I've gotten this feedback back to do more of this. It's like be be mindful of how you're talking because you want to give a nice, e easy cadence. Like I, I occasionally talk fast when I'm really excited about something, which is not not friendly to somebody who's not who isn't you know fluent English. And then also be mindful of like how you're speaking. It's like like idioms don't always work, and, right. and weird phrases don't always work. Like be be specific, be concise, and and just you know kind of get to the point. And I've rewritten emails because I'm like, wait, that doesn't make sense. This is like, like I can't even remember what bad metaphor that was, but. but it's not a good thing to put out there. Right. And every individual is different, right? So every individual mm -hmm. needs to do a self introspection of which areas they are good at. Yeah. Right? Are they good at communicating verbally certain things versus mm -hmm. are they good at putting things over an email? If they cannot, if let's say the mother tongue uh, slang comes in your talking, right? right? Then it's better to put everything on an email, right? I know email yeah. is a formal communication, but then that helps you to communicate your thoughts. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, Every individual yeah. needs to find that uh, spot for themselves. What is the right medium or channel for communication? Gotcha. Okay, well, a couple of final questions, but one just sort of broad one based, you know, just kind of to ramp it up a little bit from your experience as Jack Zachary Jeans once put it from scissors to Salesforce. Do you have any final pieces of advice for people? Yeah, uh, I'll normally uh, I've, I've captioned it in my uh, blog as well, which Zachary had uh, blog. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fortune favors the bold. So be uh -huh. curious and take your chances. Uh, speak up your mind wherever mm -hmm. required. And just be curious for everything and anything that you're doing, uh, whether it's development, whether it's consulting, whether it's interacting with your customers, uh, your peers. And the most important aspect of uh, being in this professional world is have empathy. Empathy mm. will help you uh, go places. Uh, building relationships because you can learn technology all your lives, but uh, empathy is something which will help you build those relationships in the long run. And that's our show. Now, before we go, it turns out that Ribbish's favorite non technical hobby used to be something I totally don't understand. When I was uh, growing up, it was playing cricket. Nice. But uh, since I've been into IT world, <laughs> don't get much time. Right. But uh, these days, it would be if I have to take some time off, uh, my favorite place would be listening some good Bollywood music. And to be clear, I myself do enjoy a good Bollywood tale, but I might have to get Rupish back to explain the basic mechanics of cricket to me. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Rupish for the great conversation and the information. If you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, read the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you next week. 